I said yes because she's Pat Bonham. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out tonight, um, Friday night. A lot of other things you could be doing. I'm going to a history lecture. Good Lord. Now let's see if we can outlast the basketball game. This, this is a first. I've, I've spoken in a lot of different places with different kinds of sounds and outdoor tents and God knows what, but I've never spoken next to a gym with some boots going on. This is, this is great. Uh, what Pat said about uh, you know public audience is actually so important to me. Um, it's probably got a little bit to do with my roots, but frankly, uh, this book on Douglas, which came out in fall of '18, and I had well nearly almost two years to run around talking about it before the pandemic hit, and then even during the pandemic, endless Zoom sessions book clubs and uh, public libraries and just groups of real people who read books uh, and it turns out there are millions, well thousands, certainly probably millions in this country and it's been heartening and frankly give me a public library, a historical society, audience any day than another history department. <laughs> Colleagues, uh, I, I love my field. Uh, when we give talks to each other, it just isn't as much fun. <laughs> it just isn't. Um, and it's my first visit to, to Irvington. It's hard to believe. I've been over here on the Hudson at various places, but never somehow been to Irvington. I don't know why that is. But. Um, I want to start with, with trying to imagine Douglas in a very broad context, both past and present, and then come back to him and talk a bit about how I tried to manage and organize a biography of a life like Douglas's. Uh, we're living in a, um, you don't need me to tell you this, but we are living in a time, once again, of uh, what many call history wars in the United States, struggles over history, public debates over the past, uh, roiling uh, discussions, well we wish there were discussions, <laughs> uh, struggles in school boards about how to teach race and slavery and how to teach this or that. Um, we've had many history wars in our history. A lot of you in this room are old enough to remember the 1990s very well. We had huge history wars over something called the National History Standards, which was an enormous and heroic effort to try to create something called National Standards for History that did not succeed. Uh, we had an enormous history war over how to commemorate and remember the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the famous uh, Enola Gay exhibit. Smithsonian, uh, which probably tore apart the public history world more than anything ever had, and became then a template for how to think about doing museum exhibitions or not doing museum exhibitions. We've had many, many history wars in our country. We've always had a history war over the Civil War, uh, and lo and behold, we've been reminded again in just recent years, that the memory, the struggle over the meaning and memory of that event, and its aftermath of Reconstruction, is in essence never over in America. Reconstruction has in many ways never ended. Two-thirds of all litigation in courtrooms in the United States on any given day, we're told, I'm told by my lawyer friends, is essentially 14th Amendment litigation. Section 1 of the 14th Amendment is litigated every day in our lives. And if there's one thing that may actually hold this disparate, very divided, conflicted nation together, it's Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. If you haven't read it of late, read it before you watch the news at 11 tonight. Maybe before 10. 
or bedtime anyway, if you're like me. Um, we've never gotten over the Civil War. We may never get over it. I wrote a lot about this in previous books. Um, why that is, we could discuss. Douglas is at the heart of that story, too. But what is a history war? Well, it's usually something from the past that really suddenly, or in long term possibly, but suddenly really matters in the present. Something, uh, a subject that is visceral to people, and to care about, that makes parents care about what their children are being taught. It gets people very exercised about that monument in the middle of their city, or that absence of a monument city, or that exhibition that's at the museum that is suddenly really controversial because it, it has posits a narrative that troubles people, bothers people, shocks people. The second stage of a history war is it usually then involves curriculum. It usually gets into debates over, well, what's taught? How is this taught? What is taught? By whom? To whom? And then that usually means somehow state legislatures get involved. American federalism is all over our history wars as well. Where is power? Where does power really sit in this country in terms of how the past gets used and the past gets presented? Well, there's power at the national level with certain national museums for sure. But most of this power tends to be local, which is why we fight about it. And there's a third stage history wars go through where the rhetoric about it, if, if, if something really matters enough to people, uh, the rhetoric tends to get rather existential. All sides declare that surrender is unacceptable about how the past is being used. Now, we've had periods in our history when, you know, historians just aren't controversial at all. And usually we aren't. We just keep quiet, give each other tenure, and write for each other. <laughs> Until we step outside the academy, which is where we should spend at least half our time. Um, there's a fourth stage. People choose political teams about how to use the past. We, we, we choose up sides like we do in America. My team and your team. Then the media gets involved in a, in a, in a new stage, as they must. These issues get out in the public, they, they exercise people, they have political meaning, they may even swing elections, and the media cares, they have to. That's both good and maybe not always good, because the media can really thrive on these things and can fuel the uh, competition, the anger, the debate. Sometimes it can inform. Although if you get asked to be on a talk show, you get lucky two minutes to say what you, what you have to say about something. Thank you, Professor, and now we've got to move on to the, the film review. Then the next stage have, tends to be when authorities step in. Museum curators and directors, um, historians, <laughs> academics start getting asked for opinions or they push their way in and start having opinions about what's good history and what's not. And the public is always a little suspicious about us. And who gave us the right to say what's good history? Some people love to say. And we tend to fall back on our training. Well, who trained you? Ah, uh, other historians. That's the problem, some people would say. Some parents today are saying. A lot of parents in this country don't trust. And that's what's at stake here, isn't it? It's trust. Don't trust the academy. Uh, and what ultimately comes out of history wars is that we fight about the politics of knowledge. And we gain emotional attachments to our stories, to narratives, to versions of the past that inform the present, that we want our children to learn, and then learn it at a, at, a, 
at a later age, in a later age. It, it, it is about the narratives we want to believe we're living in. And finally, one could say that history wars, the, the various kinds of history wars that we've had in the past, God knows we had them in the 60s, uh, which gave birth to the revolution in black history, the revolution in women's history, and with some time, the revolution in Native American history, and eventually the revolution in gay and lesbian history, and so on and so forth which now is all over American textbooks and does exercise some parents as well. What can ultimately happen that out of these history wars, as kind of bitter and ugly and messy as they can become, both bad and good history can come out of it. Uh, historians need to actually seize upon history wars when people are listening. We might actually have a chance to convey it something about the past. But I'd suggest, just as a way of thinking about this, I don't have any data or proof on this one, it's just a thought, that maybe America has always had a history war with itself. And that this isn't necessarily new what we're living through. It's just a heightened example of it. It's pretty bitter right now out there. Uh, we don't know where it's going. But maybe because this is a country that was actually founded on creeds. We're a creedal nation. At least those four first principles in Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. And then if you get into the Bill of Rights, you can find a few other creeds. And there are elements of the Constitution that we consider creedal. If you create a nation based on creeds, you set yourself up. You're probably going to violate them. Probably why there's something called the Ten Commandments. Because of the human condition, we're probably going to violate some of them. So maybe America, by almost its nature, its founding, its definition, is a perpetual history war. It doesn't mean they always have that doesn't mean they have to be violent. We can pray for that. It doesn't mean they have to be always embittered. Now, we, we, we good rationalists would wish this was just calm debate, and you know, then somebody sort of persuades somebody and we move on. But that's not the way history and the public works. Now, to drop Douglas into this, his life was a history war. His whole life was in some ways at war with his country at the same time he tried in his, with the, the weapons he had, which was essentially only one, words and language, he tried to reshape, to remake the history of that country. He both, at time, different times, he both hated and loved his country. A lot of Americans can say that. We'd like our children to grow up probably loving their country. You know, we, at some age, we probably, many of us want them to have a critical stand, a critical sense, a skeptical sense. Uh, or do we? How critical? <laughs> How skeptical? Uh, Douglass's life was a history war. Think about it now. Frederick Douglass is born in 1818, out on the eastern shore of Maryland, at the bend in the Tuckahoe River, uh, probably in his grandmother Betsy Bailey's cabin, he is born nobody, nowhere. The eastern shore of Maryland was the sandy soil backwater of the American Slave Society. In a real sense, it, we have no right to know about him, except for some big strides he took in his life, some good luck, and some <laughs> skills and talents and genius, whatever that is, along the way. But he's going to live from all the way to 1895, which is pretty well the whole trajectory of the 19th century. He's born before all those elements of 19th century modernity come about. He's born before the railroad. Nobody knows what a railroad is. 
when he's a child. He's born well before the telegraph. He's born uh, before the rotary press, which will revolutionize his life, and you will use as a great newspaper man, he's a great journalist. Uh, the Rotary Press that made possible first the weekly newspaper, then the, the daily newspaper. He's born before steamships and steamboats and steam power. Actually, the first steamboats exist by 1818, 1820, but they're hardly, they're very few. They're not out there on the rivers yet. But he's going to live all the way to the almost the end of the 19th century to a whole new era of modernity when they have things like they have this little thing called an internal combustion engine they don't have cars yet but they have these things called carriages and they can put one of these engines in and then it moves it down the street they have steamships that can uh, go across the Atlantic in 8 days which people still consider relatively miraculous 8 days across the Atlantic Maybe only two of those, you know, you're sick to death. Uh, they have this little things called the electric light bulbs already. They're not ubiquitous yet, but they exist. They even have this amazing thing called the phonograph that will record a person's voice. Douglas, who became the greatest orator of 19th century America, an unforgettable voice, the most widely traveled American order of that century, with one possible exception of Mark Twain. <laughs> Twain cheated, he went to Asia. Um, so far as we know, Douglas was never recorded on phone, if he could have been. He lives long enough. But I don't think he ever was. And the reason is, um, about uh, three months before he died, he went to dinner one night in Washington, D.C. with a friend, at the dinner, this man's name was Anderson, he played a phonograph recording of a black minister whom Douglas knew. And when Douglas went back home, he wrote a thank you letter for the dinner. Kind of rare now. Anybody still write thank you notes for dinner? You probably do. Um, I did for Thanksgiving because I got to go to this. Anyway, I did for the, I actually did it. They didn't walk. But anyway, he writes this letter to Mr. Anderson, and he goes on for three paragraphs about this amazing creation of the phonograph. He calls it a divine invention. And he even says, is it possible the human voice could live forever? He's talking about himself there. <laughs> but he doesn't write that if he's already been recorded, I don't think. But think of the expanse of his life. And by the way, if you, any of you are collectors, a recording of Frederick Douglass. Would you call me first? <laughs> I will make you an offer. You may not sell, but I will make you Because anybody finds that, man. Anyway. But think what, what's happened in that lifetime. What's in the middle of it? He's lived the entire experience, 20 years a slave. He's lived to write about it over and over and over and over. He lives the entire cri political crisis in the United States over slavery, its expansion, and the coming of the Civil War. He becomes a major voice in that. He's only in his 40s in the, when this American Armageddon happened, this Civil War over slavery, which will not only destroy slavery, it will force in enormous bloodshed the reinvention of the United States. A second republic will come out in the 13th, the 14th, the 15th Amendments, and various other parts of the Reconstruction legislation. But then he's going to live another 30 years to reckon with Reconstruction, to reckon with its failure eventually, its loss, its defeat, and he's going to live yet longer for the beginnings of the Jim Crow system, both in law and in practice, and then he's even going to live into the 1890s for the first years of the lynching crisis. And the last great speech of his life will be about lynching, that he writes first in 1893 as a 75-year-old man. His life was a history war. He was at war with his own country's history as he was trying to remake it. And individuals don't generally remake history. 
Now, Doug has left us so much in words and wisdom to think about. Here's one. As we think about, you know, history wars and a country, Douglas gave this definition to what a nation is. And you need a bit of context for this. It comes out of a speech he makes in 1869, consider the date. It's four years after the Civil War and emancipation. The 13th Amendment, of course, is, is in law. The 14th Amendment is now in law. The Equal Protection, the Equality Amendment, if you'd like. And the 15th Amendment, the Voting Rights Amendment, which includes black males, I know. But nevertheless, that has just passed and it will be ratified the next year. Douglas sees the United States at that moment, it's actually the most optimistic moment of his life, at that moment he sees the United States as a truly new creation. And he writes a speech called The Composite Nation. In it he says, a nation, quote, implies a willing surrender and subjection of individual aims and ends, often narrow and selfish, to the broader and better ones that arise out of a society as a whole. It is both a sign and a result of civilization. What is a nation? This is a very modern definition of a nation. Lots of theorists and anthropologists, uh, one of them named Benedict Anderson, and a whole bunch of imitators came along later and said, yeah, a nation is way into the 20th century. A nation is this imagined community of people who have, who have decided to give up a few of their grievances and disagreements to find that they do agree on this in order to form something as a whole. How are we doing with that? Surrender and subjection of individual aims and ends, often narrow and selfish. How many Americans are running around, running around uh, volunteering to give up their selfish urges? Humility is out of vogue. In that same composite nation speech, which by the way reads like, it reads like a multiculturalism manifesto from the 1990s. It reads like every university's mission statement today. It's diversity on steroids. It's Douglas imagining, he says, he says explicitly, he says, the United States at this moment has an opportunity, like no people in human history ever have, to have a multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multi-racial nation all living under equality before law. An audacious idea. But he says, look, look, we've got, here it is. Yeah, it took terrible bloodshed. It took this horrible war. But look, look what's possible. In that speech, he says, well, many things, but uh, just two passages here. He says, at one point, quote, we are a country of all extremes, ends and opposites. The most conspicuous example of composite nationality in the world. I'm saying in 1869. In races, we range all the way from black to white with intermediate shades, which, as in the apocalyptic vision, no man can name or number. We are so diverse, he said, already in 1869. And he also says, well, Actually, forgive me, 10 years earlier, 1859, Douglas said, the Hungarian, the Italian, the Irishman, the Jew, and the Gentile all find in this goodly land a home. It's on the eve of the Civil War. My white fellow countrymen have no other use for us, I mean black people, whatever and to coin dollars out of our blood. Now those are two different Douglases, ten years apart. But that optimistic, incredibly hopeful moment 
wasn't going to last terribly long, unfortunately. Um, and I find no example of him, I, I can't find an example of him giving the composite nation speech after about 1872-73. Those of you who know your Reconstruction history know that Reconstruction was in trouble by then. He doesn't chart this one out anymore. Now, why do we still talk about Frederick Douglass? Why, and why do I write this book? Um, lots of answers to that, but to be very direct, I wrote the book in great part because I had the tremendous good fortune of literally bumping into a private collection of Douglass manuscripts that had never been used before. That's what every historian wishes for, dreams of, I remember my mentor in graduate school, Dick Sewell, rest his soul, beloved man, I loved him. But <laughs> in his office once he said, well, with research, you have to go out and make your own luck. And I remember thinking, what? I didn't make luck. I thought luck was just luck. Ah, <laughs> uh, he had this story that, that he was, uh, when he was doing his uh, first book on John Hale, New England abolitionist, he happened, he was in New Hampshire, where Hale was from. Hale was a very important political abolitionist. Dick said, you know, I was there in that state archive for long enough, and suddenly one day they got a call, and someone had found a huge stash of Hale letters in an attic. I said, well, that's great, but did you make that look? <laughs> well, I didn't make this look. Long story short, about 15 years ago now, I think, could be 16, uh, I went to Savannah, Georgia to give a talk to middle and high school teachers, which I loved doing, about Douglas. And uh, my host there, which was the Georgia Historical Society, the man who runs it, said, there's a local gentleman here who's a collector, he'd like to come to lunch with us. I apparently said, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> anyway, that day I meet Walter Evans, who took me over to his house which is a big, beautiful, four-story brownstone in Savannah. If you know Savannah at all, it's just two blocks off Forsyth Park. Walter is a, an African-American retired surgeon who grew up in segregated Savannah, um, came north for uh, all of his higher education. Howard University is an undergraduate, and also a stop briefly in, at Hartford University in Connecticut, and then the Michigan Medical School. And he practiced as a surgeon in Detroit for 35 years, general surgeon. He gave us a lot in common, because I'm from Michigan, I'm a lifetime Tigers fan, so is he. Except Walter had season tickets, we could never afford them. <laughs> Wish I'd known him then. Uh, anyway, he uh, got interested in collecting early. He plowed his money. I know sir, I knew surgeons did well, but Walter did very well. But he plowed his money into African-American manuscripts and rare books and art. He has probably the finest collection of African-American art, especially paintings in private hands, anywhere in the world. But that day, he took me over to his house, and on his dining room table, he got up portions of his Douglas collection, the core of which consists of about nine very large family scrapbooks, kept by, principally by two of Douglas' sons, over the last 30 to 35 years of the father's life. And then a lot of other material, uh, family letters, letters from the sons to the father, Lots of photographs, etc., etc. Um, I was not the first historian to ever see this collection, but I was the first to use it. And it took me many, many, many months to make a decision that I was going to devote myself to a full life of Doug. Now, this is a daunting life, folks. Some of you in this audience I know are biographers. I had dinner with one distinguished biographer, I don't know where he's sitting. But biography's not easy. Uh, well, no, it was easy, but I didn't want to do this. I had put Douglas out of my life. I did my first book on Douglas in graduate school. I edited editions of his autobiographies. I'd written essays on Douglas and 
Douglas is some part, at least, of every other book I've ever written. But I had Douglas gone. Until I ran into Walter. It's all his fault. I spent, oh, I don't know how many Yale spring breaks in Savannah. Tough duty, because it's Azalea time. It's really tough duty marching. And a whole lot of other weeks uh, doing research on the Evans's dining room table. Greatest archive I've ever had the privilege of working in. Linda would put the coffee on in the morning. They had uh, two rules with me. Don't come before 8 a.m., which was very easy. And never put your coffee cup on the same table with the documents. And I never violated that so far as I know. Anyway, uh, many, 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 many of those weeks later, uh, I was trying to write this book. Now, why are we here talking about Douglas? A lot of answers. Let me give you a, a short list. And I'll circle back to how I organized the book a little bit. And I'd love to hear your thoughts and questions. We're here because he was the prose poet of American democracy. You hear the word democracy a lot now. Uh, I've never in my lifetime heard the word democracy used as many times as I have in the last five years. Our democracy is uh, in some peril. I've never heard the word truth used so many times. Historians you know, always just shy away from the word truth. I mean, I, yeah, we we'll look for the truth. We don't quite find the truth. That's scary. Now we're always in the word truth. In fact, we're proud that if we have some truth, we're proud to say it. Maybe that's Trump's greatest legacy. We can now talk about truth. Sorry, that didn't mean for you. I'll come back to Douglas as a prose poet in terms of his words in just a moment. The second reason we're here is that with a kind of unsurpassed eloquence, which is sometimes hard to fathom how he came by it, he explained the nature of slavery in both physical and mental terms, uh, as well as anyone. Ever. Uh, in his autobiographical voice, in his oratorical voice, in his political and political voice, as an editor of a newspaper, he had several different kinds of voices. Thirdly, we're here because with a kind of terrible honesty, and sometimes a savage irony, he was a great ironist, um, Douglas examined American hypocrisy with its creeds, pretty much as no one else, at least in his century. The great American contradiction, a nation founded on these, these glorious creeds, and they are life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, the doctrine of popular sovereignty, the right of revolution, liberty, equality, all those words are there. They're, they're the amazing creations of the Enlightenment. But that same nation became one of the two largest slave societies in the world. Fourthly, he became one of those people who didn't, didn't just become a celebrity. That's our word, by the way. They, they used the word fame in the 19th century. They didn't even have the word celebrity. But to see or hear double uh, and Maurizio, is it Maurizio? Could you pop that back yeah, just a little? I want to show you just a few more images. Go ahead, go ahead, a little bit, a little bit, more. one more, maybe one more, and then one more. Okay. This is the old Douglas here. We'll come back to the younger Douglas in a minute. But to see or hear Douglas became a kind of a wonder of the American world. I have so many examples from press clipping and other in people's letters describing the first time they saw Douglas speak and the first time they heard Douglas's voice and so on and so on. He had that kind of um, charismatic presence, but also uh, that kind of um, control over an audience with language. 
Fifthly, he, we're here in part because he was a women's rights man before there were men. Now, he wasn't always consistent with this, but he was a true women's rights man. He was the only black abolitionist at the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848 in the state of New York. Um, he not only supported the women's right to vote early in his career, he supported women's economic rights in the state of New York. Repeatedly had a bill before its legislature in the 1850s to give women a degree of economic equality, to give them a right to their property in divorce, for example, which is a huge issue in the 19th century. Or the right, just the sheer right to own property in a woman's own name. If she wasn't married, or even if she was married. Now, he will have a terrible, he will, he will become very close with the great leaders of the women's suffrage movement, Elizabeth K. Stem, Susan B. Anthony, Lucy Stone, and many others. He will have a terrible falling out with some of them over the 15th Amendment. 69 and 70 because it did not include women. Now, we can grouse about that all we want. Unfortunately, the fact was if women had been in the 15th Amendment, there wouldn't have been a 15th Amendment. Those are all men and all white men in the Congress who are voting for it. That was not a mystery. Uh, uh, we can come back to that if you'd like. Um, a sixth reason we're here, and I love this one as a biographer. He could be at times a radical thinker, virtually a revolutionary thinker. But then at other times, depending on when you're looking and taking your snapshots, he could also be a real proponent of political liberalism and a very good practicing political pragmatist. Douglas never really fit into any one box. He grows over time. Of course, events change. But one thing I came, you know when you're doing biography, there's some things you can never quite fully know about your subject. You wish you could say, yes, that's the truth. <laughs> but there are some things you, you do know. The one thing I know is that Douglas was a sponge. You gotta remember, this is a guy who grows up a slave, never set foot one day in his life in a formal classroom. He had some help in how he got his alphabet, how he learned to read and write, and how he got to practice that reading and writing, even while he was a slave. And then after he escapes from slavery, he learns a great deal from the abolitionist world that he enters into. He models William Lloyd Garrison, he models Wendell Phillips, he models a number of but this man was a sponge. If he met you, Douglas would figure out what he could learn from you. What, what, do you, what do you have that I, what do you have? What can you teach me? What should I read? And when he might, and this, was, this did not help him to keep some friendships, when he thought he'd learned all he could learn from you, he'd just, just put you aside. I'm done with you. Teach me something. And he was impatient. One of the first facts to understand about Douglas is that he was first and foremost an orphan with no education. Orphans with no education are not always nice. They're not always easy friends. They're sometimes a little damaged, whatever that psychologically might mean. And he'd been ravaged by slavery. So he didn't fit in any box. Depends on when you look at what time in his life. He's not always consistent. I have always found that the most interesting people and the most interesting thinkers are those who are not always consistent. Even though we are, of course, aren't we? <laughs> I'm always consistent. Um, another reason we're here to talk about him is, I already said this, he both loved and hated his country. He, in so many ways, you can see this in through time. When he came back from England, this flowering experience he had as a young man from 27 to 28 years old, 
spends 18 months in the British Isles, Ireland, Scotland, and England, where he is lionized, he is fed, feted. He becomes a hero of the Irish, Scottish, and British anti-slavery movement. He makes lifetime uh, friendships and relationships, and one group of them even purchased his freedom from his slave owners back in Maryland. But, you know, and, and he had experienced as a human being uh, a place where racism was it existed in Britain in the 1840s, but it was nothing like the United States. And he comes back to the hothouse of American racism and pro-slavery ideology in 1847, and he goes out on the circuit. The first time he, he just, he's back out on the circuit, the third day he's back, and he is just delivering angry. He's an angry young black man. And he begins many of his speeches with the line, I have no country. I hate America, and it hates me back. Wendell Phillips, great abolitionist, took him aside at one point there in 1847 and said to him, basically, uh, Fred, uh, can you tone it down? You're going to lose the audience, man. This, come on, it's control it here. And he didn't control it very well for a while. There's a lot to learn in that love-hate relationship of a Frederick Douglass. He's hardly alone in this over time with his country. And that's the reason we're here. Douglass is a major proponent. And conservatives love this. And not without some reason. He was a great proponent of self-reliance. Um, that is, of arguing to his fellow black people that they need to build their own community. They need to create their own schools. They need to have their own initiative. They need to get property. He was always preaching to his own sons, and his daughter for that matter, although she had a terrible marriage. Uh, he's always preaching to his sons, get property, get property, get property. And they did, or tried. Big proponent of self-reliance. But at the same time, he was a fierce activist. He believed in interventionist government to do what? Well, to free the slaves, to defeat the Confederacy, and to protect black people in the wake of emancipation against the ravages of violence in the South and across the country. He never, had, he never figured it all out of exactly what the role of government ought to be in people's lives, but he was thoroughly and completely convinced that government was a friend of the lowly. That government had become, with the war, the friend of the former slave. At least that was the hope. And, but what we've done with Douglas over time is American conservatism is about, and particularly a few in particular, uh, particular a few individuals, I should say, have adopted Frederick Douglass as this great paradigm of self-reliance, self-help, and limited government. Nothing could be more wrong than that last part. There are many examples of this. Clarence Thomas is, in some ways, the most obvious and visible. Clarence Thomas has a huge portrait of Frederick Douglass on his office wall at the Supreme Court. He loves Douglass, and he loves to quote the passages where Douglass talks about self-reliance. None other than Kevin McCarthy, I think you know who he is, has a portrait of Frederick Douglass right behind his desk in the U.S. Capitol. Or maybe it's in the House office building. Uh, Kevin McCarthy loves to, to refer to Douglas as a great Republican. <laughs> he was a Republican in another century, in another time, under a very different definition. But he's a very interesting figure in that sense, that he was an activist about uses of government and he was an advocate of self-reliance. And why can't you be both? And to be a black leader in the 19th century, you had to be both. How could you not preach self-reliance as a black leader in the 1850s, 60s, or 70s? 
How do you not preach self-reliance to your fellow black folks in a country that would enslave you? Uh, maybe lynch you? Or at least put you into a second-class segregated uh, world that you can never escape? How can you not preach self-reliance in that context? And lastly, I think we still return to Douglas. I think we are anyway because he was fundamentally, though, one of his most famous speeches is, has this in the title, he was fundamentally not a self-made man. Now here he, had, he gave a classic speech dozens and dozens of times. He gave it first in 1859, he does it again many, many countless times after the Civil War. It was one of his most popular speeches. He took, it on, he took a text of it on the road with him on his three-month speaking tours in the 1870s and 1880s because he never knew in an audience that's what they wanted, excuse me, that's what they wanted to hear, the self-made man speech. Douglas wasn't entirely self-made. Yes, he escaped from slavery. Yes, by his own incredible, clever scheme that he hatched with a few other people who helped him. But particularly the women in his life helped make him over and over. We love the self-made man imagery, symbol, myth in America. And by the way, that speech, self-made man, is, is a truly great speech. It sometimes gets diminished because of its subject these days. Because somehow, some of us on the left are not supposed to like the idea of self-made man. Actually, the self-made man speech is, is right out of Emerson. Uh, and it's it's a it's a embrace and celebration of the power of the human will. And then let's say we come back to him because very few other Americans, certainly in his century, seized the King James language of the Bible and used it to deliver. Um, the most enduring critique of slavery, coming of this union and civil war, the war itself, emancipation, reconstruction, and beyond. Douglas was extraordinarily steeped in biblical language, biblical metaphor, biblical storytelling, and especially from the Hebrew prophets. Last but not least, if you're looking for somebody to just hang on to a little bit. And, and again, Douglas didn't have this all figured out. He's a very flawed man. Very, he's very human. human. But if you look for somebody to hang on to in, in this drift we're in with our political culture in America, there was always a moral purpose to Douglas's politics. Born of his experience, born of the issues he was dealing with, there was a moral purpose in his politics. He could dance around political ideas. He could be politically savvy. He learned how to be a pragmatist, especially when he got inside the Republican Party. But his politics had a morality. Now, every biographer, I think, when you sit down and try to organize a life, you have to figure out, all right, how am I going to put this life in order? If somebody writes your biography, or your biography, they're going to put you in order. It's scary, isn't it? Uh, based on what you left, the sources you've left. Some of which, if you're important in the world, you probably really tried to control those sources, too. If you're Frederick Douglass, you wrote 1,200 pages of autobiography. Man, are you trying to control your biography? But a biographer has to put the thing in order, huh? Not just what order we're going to tell the life in, uh, but what are its big pieces? What are its big themes? I did not know what my, ultimately became what I think are six big themes in my Bible. I didn't know what they all were until I was writing it, until I was well into it. I just pushed the ball onto the road and kept pushing it and kept trying to narrate a life, narrate his story. 
But over time, I began to realize, aha, that's what I'm talking about. Aha, that's a theme. And I'll give it to you very quickly, I hope quickly. I, I did come up with, in the end, six big themes. I've already really named the couple. The first is words. Any, anybody writing about Frederick Douglass is essentially writing about his language. Uh, Maurizio, if you would mind just popping in the head. Oh, I love that photo. That's, that's 1850. One more, if you would. And then one more second. That's it. That's an 1857 photograph of Douglass. It's a stunner. By the way, some of you have perhaps no doubt learned that Douglas, we believe, uh, may have been the most photographed American of the 19th century. There's a little fuss now over whether Grant might have more excellent photographs. And for a while, people thought it was Custer. Uh, go figure. I don't know. Um, but there, there are now about 164, I think, at last count, extant photographs of Douglas. There are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, one of which was his ubiquitous travel, especially by the 1850s and then into the war years and especially after the war. Everywhere he went, the local photographer wanted, wanted him to come sit in the studio. But also, a second major reason there's so many photographs of Douglas is because he sought them. He sought out photographers, and he eventually had his favorite photographers. He had some he went back to 11 and 12 times. One of them was this guy named Hearn in Philadelphia. He loved the way he did his photographs. In fact, I think Hearn may have done this one. At any rate, and Douglas found they loved this new technology, photography. His first photographs were all daguerreotypes, really the original form of photography. Eventually, there are tintypes. He doesn't quite live long enough for the Kodak. Kodak was first created in the 1890s. The uh, virtually instant photographs are that old. But he didn't quite live that long. But Douglas embraced photography as a way of disseminating his own image. And to Douglas, that meant the image of a brilliant, beautiful, well-dressed, educated black man who's probably not what you expect to see in a black man in the 19th century. And when Douglas didn't like a certain profile or a certain image, he would hang around to get the image developed, he would make him do it over. Until he liked it. He very carefully chose the frontispieces on his autobiographies. Um, so photography for him became another language. But for Douglas, his whole life was about words. Words. How can that be for a former slave with no education? Well, there are a lot of answers for that. Um, part of it is a, a little bit of a mystery. There's mystery about every great writer, isn't there? I mean, who was William Shakespeare? And I, I buy the argument that there was only one of them, because uh, Jim Shapiro is a good friend of mine. And he wrote a book saying there's only one, I believe, Jim Shapiro. I don't know. Maybe there were five Shakespeare's. Probably not. Man, how could somebody write that? All of that. Um, Goethe. How could Goethe produce all of that? From poetry to novels to essays and everything in between. And we could go on and on. Douglas belongs now in a canon of writers who wrote in all kinds of voices and all kinds of ways. 1,200 pages of autobiography, hundreds and hundreds of the short form political editorials in his newspapers, hundreds delivered thousands of times speeches. And Trust me on this one. Every major Frederick Douglass speech, and by major speech, there are 25 or 30 of them, all exist in a script form, in a text. He wrote them first. He was not the kind of order who just walked into a hall, blew the lights out off the top of his head, 
was sermonic oratory. He could do that. And he would obviously break from his chest at times and blow out some lights. But he wrote them down first. In fact, if you ever, if we could ever summon him back, if I could ever get him to show up, just come so we can question him. And if I ever had to really ask him, Sir, what's the single most important thing you ever did? My best guess is he'd pull a pen out of his pocket and he'd say, I was a writer in a world that didn't believe black people were writers. And he was a compulsive writer. Douglas was the kind of person who didn't know what he thought about something until he went to his desk to write it down. And out of that came all the great speeches. To understand Douglas, you got to understand him in his language. Second big theme in the book, so related to the first, is the autobiographies themselves, and I really already said this. When you work on a guy like Douglas, the autobiographies, since there's three, one in 1845, one in 1855, and the third one he writes in 1881, and then he even revised that in other terms, it's really four of them. The autobiographies are both your source and your subject. Because you not only have to, you know, use the autobiographies for everything you can glean about his life, even though he's hiding so much from you, but you have to keep explaining also why did he keep writing about himself so much? Why does he seem to believe he has this story to tell that he has to keep telling? Is that just pure vanity? It's part of it. But it's also because he came to believe, not only did he die, he came to believe that his story belonged to country, the story belonged to his people, that he had to keep telling it. Third big thing in the book I've also said, and that is the Bible. Pick up any Frederick Douglass speech, from the great ones like the Fourth of July speech, to the Lessons of the Hour speech on lynching, to you name it. His great speech unveiling the Lincoln Freedman's Memorial statue in Washington in 1876, with which I start the book. Now controversial because people want to take that monument down. Pick any major Douglas speech. The Bible is in it. Sometimes very explicitly. There's six uses of the Old Testament in his great Fourth of July speech. Three from Isaiah, two from the Psalms, and I think the, the other one is Jeremiah. Douglas loved the Hebrew prophets, particularly Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and sometimes a few others. He sometimes quotes them directly, verbatim, he sometimes paraphrases. He loved paraphrasing the Psalms. He was a biblical storyteller because it was the biblical language which is where he first learned English. It's where he first came by language. It's where he first began to hear language. He attended four different churches while he was a slave in Baltimore. Two pastored by white pastors, two by black pastors, he heard all kinds of homiletics. He heard all kinds of sermons. He heard all... God only knows how many times he heard the Exodus story invoked. And then he began to read it. And I got access to his surviving library, which is big. It's huge. It's between three and 4,000 volumes. A few of them are in Cedar Hill, National Park Service house in Washington, D.C., most of them are in a warehouse out in Landover, Maryland, owned by the National Park Service. They have those accordion shelves, you know, where you push a button and they go back and forth. And Douglas's entire, I was so thrilled to see his book collection. I was assuming he had annotated his books and was going to be marginalia. Man, I was going to learn a whole new world. He didn't market his books much. Damn. Not like we do today, I scratch and everything. People loved and respected books a little more, I think, in the 19th century. They didn't mark them up. Now here, once in a while, they mark something up. He owned individual books that were interpreters' guides to individual books of the Bible. He owned two different guides to the book of Isaiah. He owned he had three complete works of Shakespeare. He had two complete works of Robert Burns, who is a Burns lover, hate Robert Burns, 
he loved rubber burn, romantic poetry. But the Bible became a kind of, uh, it was a text for him, it was a source, it was a voice. And it was there that I began to realize I had to think about using this word prophet in the title of the book. But I was actually frightened by that word, to be perfectly honest. I wanted to call him a prophet, but I didn't, I didn't understand what I, what I meant by that yet. And I realized, because I have no, you know, full disclosure, I have no formal theology training at all. I've read a lot of theology, I love reading but I have some theologian friends who were a huge help to me. Uh, the late, just recently deceased, uh, Don Schreiber, who used to be president of Union Theological right here in New York, uh, was a huge help to me. He got me reading Walter Brueggemann on the Old Testament. Uh, a dear friend of mine in Brooklyn, Richard Rabinowitz, who is not technically a theologian, he's just read everything. He got me reading uh, Robert Alter. Uh, who is now famously a translator of the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, and then a, a rabbi in New Haven who I've become dear friends with, Jim Conan. He used to be head rabbi at Yale. He and his wife, Alana, used to attend my lecture class. They'd sit up in the front row, and sometimes we'd go have lunch, and he learned my dilemma about Douglas and his word prophet. And he said, oh, David, sit down. He says, you've got to read Abraham Heschel. And there's a lot of Heschel to read, you know, 40 books. But read this, 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 and that. And start with the book called The Prophets. And I did. And by reading Heschel especially, and others, I began to get comfortable with definitions of what a prophet is. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, in the Hebrew prophet tradition, and that's the tradition Douglas understood, it was from Heschel that I began to find passages where I said, oh my God, that's Douglas. Heschel would describe a prophet this way, and I'd say, yep, that's Douglas, that's what he does. For example, Heschel says, quote, the prophet is human, yet he employs notes one octave too high for our ears. He experiences moments that defy our understanding. He is neither a singing saint nor a moralizing poet, but an assaulter of our minds. The prophet's job, Heschel argues over and over and over, is to assault our minds, to trouble us, to remind us of our declensions, to tell us that we're at risk. <laughs> and then some. Was Heschel also said, I mean, so many great Heschel passages, said, you know, the prophet, the true prophet probably was shattered by something in his or her own life so that he can shatter us. I said, okay, that's Douglas. He's been shattered. And he's good at shattering. The prophet, it turns out, in this tradition, is the person who finds a way to use words that the rest of us can't. The rest of us can't quite reach. And if you read enough Douglas, I'd say especially in the speeches, but elsewhere as well, you will read passages and you'll think, oh my goodness, Woo! how do you capture that? And you read it again. Oh, it's going to be good. Wow, where did that metaphor come from? Because it works. Now, he used too many adjectives. He was a typical 19th century writer. And thank God, he'd, he'd, he'd throw seven adjectives down sometimes. We would scratch those out today. We'd correct that. So I got more and more comfortable with calling Douglas a prophet. And lastly, I found, I didn't know this at first, but I found what I was doing in the book as I was telling the story, and this is a fourth major theme, of a radical outsider. You know, the old radical abolitionist, always on the outside of power, knocking on doors, but never getting in, who over time, with the Civil War and emancipation and owning up to the Republican Party and the Reconstruction, he's an old radical outsider who becomes a political insider. Now what does that do? What compromises does he make? 
What does that do to his own psyche? Fifth major theme, true of I think most modern biography now, is I was determined here to tell both the public and the private story, but never to write a single chapter that didn't have both. And the reason is, I don't think we'll ever realize that. If any of you have a public life, even if, if you're a teacher, for whatever you do, you have a public life in your profession. You know, you have some days when it's mostly your public life, because you work so damn hard. But we live both sides of that every day of our lives. So I was determined there wasn't going to be a chapter just on the two wives. There wasn't going to be a chapter just on the children. There wasn't going to be a chapter just on the Emancipation Proclamation and Crisis with Lincoln. That every chapter would somehow balance public and private, public and private. I don't always pull that off, but I tried really hard with that. And I didn't fully know I was doing that until I was a fair ways into it. And I realized, oh, that's a good idea. Maybe I'll keep doing it. And then the last, the sixth theme, one, is kind of obvious, but it's important. And that is Douglas, this artist, this thinker, seriously, who is now treated by formal philosophy by political theorists. There are no less than three books out now on Douglas as a political theorist, especially the natural rights tradition, uh, as a constitutional thinker. There are at least two full books of essays on Douglas as a constitutional thinker. And then there's Douglas, this writer, this artist. Um, and I tried, to, from the moment he becomes a public person, the last day of his life, try to keep that story alive at all times. I would just end with uh, simply saying that uh, I don't know uh, why Douglas has become so interesting to so many people. I guess we needed him during the Trump era, during the pandemic, and maybe we've always needed him because we are a country. It's kind of always having a history war with itself, and too often it's over the same issues that he faced uh, throughout his life. Thank you. Lynching was happening in 
United States. And it still stands up pretty well. Uh, but it's a horrible subject. It's a despairing subject. But even if that speech, on a full embrace of the natural rights tradition, that the right to liberty, the right to equality, the right, you know, the human right to life, as Douglas would put it, were permanent, natural, from God and forever. So no matter what you do to us or do to anybody, you can't kill those. He would still resurrect that kind of hope, even at the end of a very bleak kind of speech. You can find the darkness in Douglas, not just in those last years, uh, a lot of darkness in Douglas uh, the last 20 years of his life, in the wake of Reconstruction. Even as early as 1869, in a different speech than that composite, than that optimistic one, he said, "You know, the problem we have is that slavery. This is his, his words: slavery did not die honestly." I always love that passage. And then he goes on to say, "It did not die because Americans woke up and had a referendum and voted it out. It was obliterated by massive violence. It was destroyed." In didn't die honestly. It died because the Confederacy fought, you know, almost to the last man to defend it. That was a way of saying, we got a huge problem ahead for us. Because this didn't die because it was the choice of the, of the consensus of the nation. It was the choice of part of the nation. Um, but he never lost faith in, in these creeds. And I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that because I wanted him not to lose his faith in that. He didn't. He also had nowhere else to turn. He never fully gave up on the Republican Party either, although that he was sorely tested on that one. Yes, sir. Yeah. Just say a few words about his relationship with President Lincoln. Yeah. Especially when Lincoln started the United Nations with possibly leaving parts of mm -hmm. slavery and how he really... Yeah. Had him rethink it all and mm -hmm. the critical back and forth and knocking sure. on the door at night and all that. <laughs> well, uh, I'll try to be very short with that. It's hard. Uh, the relation, Douglas' relationship with Lincoln is, is utterly fascinating. They start at a very different place at the beginning of the war. By the way, Douglas only first became aware of Abraham Lincoln in the Lincoln Douglas debates in Illinois in 1858. And Douglas actually went to Illinois. It's in my book. He was in Illinois for at least two of the Lincoln Douglas debates. <laughs> and Stephen Douglas even used his imagery of Frederick Douglas in, 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 in his debating with Lincoln. At one point, he accuses Abraham Lincoln of riding around in cages with Fred, in cages, riding around in carriages with Fred Douglas. That was his way of saying that Lincoln was a lover of black people. Um, they start in a very different place in 1860-61. Douglas doesn't trust Lincoln. Uh, Douglas was a ferocious critic of Lincoln in 61, if you know your Civil War years here, 61 and well into 62. Especially of the policy of returning fugitive slaves to their masters or owners if they were loyal, as the law said. Impossible task for Union officers Nevertheless, that was the policy. Douglas was so angry over that that he called Lincoln at one point in late fall of 61 the most powerful slave catcher in America. Um, there are many other episodes there in 1862 where he pillowed his Lincoln until the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. And almost everything changed. There's still 100 days from the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation of September 62 to January 1st, Emancipation, uh, the final proclamation. And those were a very tense 100 days. Uh, and Douglas kind of goes up and, up and down with his own faith in those times. He's still editing his newspaper. So we did monthly editorials at that point. But once the proclamation was signed and disseminated, in part because it had two new features. 
There was going to be no more effort by the Lincoln administration at colonization, at the forced removal or even voluntary removal of black people from America, which the Lincoln administration had been working on in various schemes and ways throughout 62, and tried to recruit Frederick Douglass to be their colonization czar. Right. Nothing made Douglass go ballistic. More than that, in September, August, September of 62, when Montgomery Blair in Lincoln's cabinet tries to recruit him to lead their colonization scheme to get black people to leave America, the letter he wrote to Montgomery Blair, three pages, is just a classic letter, basically telling Montgomery Blair where he could put his invitation to be um, czar of colonization. But the second thing the proclamation had, of course, was the order to recruit black men into the Union Army and Navy. That was a game changer. Now, that's going to have a lumpy road, and a difficult road. But Douglas and Lincoln started at, a, at very different places in 1861. But by 63, late 63 and into 1864, up to the Lincoln's re-election in 64, it is as if by 1864 they have come to essentially the same script. Um, in other words, Lincoln grew toward the policy of emancipation in ways that by and large Douglas came to not only support but even celebrate. So it's, and of course Lincoln is when Lincoln is murdered, uh, it's a tremendous loss to Douglas, uh, as it was to so many people. But Douglas was at the second inaugural. I mean, if you've read my book, you know this. He was there. He was off to Lincoln's left, about 12 or 15 people deep in the crowd. He went to Washington and said, I'm going to be there. He, he, he marched behind the presidential carriage in the crowd up Pennsylvania Avenue back to the White House after the second inaugural. He heard the second inaugural. He went to the White House. Maybe you know this, I don't know. But he went to the White House, he got in line. Big reception, of course. And uh, he put his card up uh, to, to this officer and said, please let me in. He said, no, you don't have an invitation, you can't come in. You're not invited. And the way Douglas tells the story, he said, tell the President Frederick Douglass is out here. Two minutes later, somebody came out and said, come on in. And then they had this meeting in the East Room. And we have one witness to this. It's an important witness. Because otherwise, the only evidence we have on this is Douglas's third author. <laughs> but Douglas tells us that he and Lincoln came together in the East Room. And Lincoln came walking over to him and said, Mr. Douglas, what did you think of my speech? And according to Douglas, he told the president, Mr. President, it doesn't matter what I think. Attend to all of your guests, please, Mr. President. No, Douglas, I want to know what you think. According to Douglas, he said, Mr. President, that was a sacred effort. And if you think of the language, especially in the third paragraph of the second inaugural, that's exactly what it was. That is a speech, this is what I argue, that is a speech Douglas had been writing for Lincoln for two years in his own way. But that Lincoln gave it, embracing emancipation as the essential result of the war, was all the more important, because he's the president. Every drop of blood shed by the flash shall be paid by blood shed by the sword. <sighs> ah, so was, and out on the, out on the stump later, whether it's in Lincoln eulogies or just using, Douglas would use that phrase over and over. Don't forget, President Lincoln told us that every drop of bloodshed by the life shall be paid by bloodshed by the sword. Don't forget the results of the war was his way of, that one of his, was one of his ways of saying that. Now, I should say, and look, the Lincoln subject goes on and on and on, doesn't That's why there are 10,000 books on Lincoln. Um, the rest of his life, Lincoln, uh, Douglas created really three different kinds of Lincoln. 
This is what everybody does with Lincoln. You just create the Lincoln you want. Get right with Lincoln. He created a Lincoln in June of 1865, which is the totally heroic, almost godlike, ascended uh, Abraham the Great Emancipator. But in 1876, with which I start the book, the speech unveiling the statue of the standing Lincoln, the kneeling slave, he invents a very different Lincoln. He calls black people Abraham Lincoln's stepchildren. He calls Lincoln the white man's president. It's a dead honest speech. And then he creates yet another kind of Lincoln later on that he uses in Republican clubs, gatherings of Republican politicians, gatherings of Republican men. One of the best is about 1891, he's in Brooklyn, and at a Republican club. These are, sometimes these are called Union League clubs, and they always have portraits of Lincoln on the wall. And oh my goodness, Lincoln by then again is the savior of the nation, the savior of the emancipated slaves, the savior of the world, or the greatest leader God ever put on the planet Earth. That's almost the way he puts it. So he, he created a lot of different kinds of Lincolns, which is tends to do what we've done ever since. So thanks for that question. Yes, sir? You mentioned that uh, Frederick Douglass was an uneducated author. Was there some turning point in his early life um, uh -huh. or incident that, that gave him the part to what he was to become? You mean it gave him his uh, literary will? Yes, and opportunity. Yeah, well, the first is being taught to read, not to write yet, but to read by his mistress of all, Sophia Hall. She's the wife of Hugh Hall, who's the brother of Douglas's owner, Thomas Hall. Douglas was sent to Baltimore to live with him. He was seven years old, seven, eight, and nine, when Sophia sits him down and teaches him his alphabet and actually read the Bible out loud. Now, what does an eight-year-old understand? Uh, Douglas claimed he remembered hearing her read the book of Job aloud to him. Now, if you would read the book of Job to an eight-year-old slave, <laughs> she might have just loved the language or something. But then, the second great turning point in this, and I could go through a lot of them, but the second very important turning point. First of all, he clearly as a kid, he, he, really, he loves language. He's just collecting stuff, shreds of newspapers, whatever you can find, read, read, read. Um, but when he's about 10 and 11, he encounters and then discovers and gets a copy of a book called The Columbian Orator. It's absolutely crucial in his life. This book was published in 1797 by a man named Caleb Bingham, who hailed from up, in, up here in Salisbury, Connecticut later became uh, the creator of uh, schools in the Boston area. Uh, Bingham put together in 1797 this reader that was a, a large collection of mostly Enlightenment-era speeches, some from the classical era. There's some Demosthenes and Cicero, but it's mostly from the British and American Enlightenment. And some of them have slavery or anti-slavery as a theme. And Bingham also in this book wrote, he and a, a, a partner, wrote five or six dialogues for children. One of the dialogues is where a slave convinces and persuades his owner to free him. Hmm. Um, that book became magic to Douglas. And in great part, because the first 20 pages of it was a manual on oratory. It literally is a manual of how to make a speech, how to gesture with your hands, how to use your shoulders, what to do with your neck while speaking, <laughs> how to modulate your voice, how you start lower and you build and build and build and build to crescendos and so on. It's, it's, a, it's a manual about speech making. In fact, it's got, I don't know if Caleb Bingham read Aristotle, but it's got a lot of sort of classical stuff in it about oratory. This book was just magic to Douglas. And he, meant, he, 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 he encountered it because the little white guys in the streets of Baltimore 
were carrying it around. It was their school reader. It was the second best selling school reader in the United States for over 50 years, second only to the McGuffey Reader. It was published in some 37 or 38 different editions. I have an edition of it back in print. That it, it was out of print for eons. It's in print. You, you can get it from NYU Press with an introduction for it. It turns out Abraham Lincoln called it one of his favorite books at New Salem in Illinois when he was a, you know, a teenager reading everything he could get his hands on. Lincoln had a lot of other things he read, too, compared to Douglas. But that book was magic. And Douglas later, when he was a 16-year-old, 17-year-old, he had this band of brothers, he called them his band of brothers, that he would lean on Sunday afternoons out in a brush arbor somewhere where he would uh, teach them how to preach. From the Bible or from the Columbian Order. And when he escaped from slavery in August 1838, the only possessions on his body were a few dollars in one pocket, the Columbian Order in his other pocket of his sailor's pantaloons. That's all he had. That copy, Douglas's own copy, is at Cedar Hill today, uh, the house in Washington. And I had a great good fortune. I got to know the curators there, and they, let, they used to let me come after hours. They were closing, and they let me kind of... They didn't let me have the run of the house. And they made me put gloves on. But I got to hold his copy and sit at his desk. That very book is the one he brought up with. So, those are just two early turning points in how he comes to this idea of language and oratory. But to him, oratory was power, too. He was the only literate slave among these guys on this farm where they were all stashed. There were, there were field hands by day, but on Sunday they could go out in the woods and he could preach with them. It was, a, so it was a form of power. Language was a power for them. It was a weapon for them. And he knows that even before he can leave slavery. But one of the first things he does when he gets to New Bedford, Massachusetts, as a 20-year-old, and then 21, when he and Anna get there, is he goes and joins the local Amy Church, the Amy Zion Church, small black church in New Bedford. Within the first year he's there, at age 21, they had him in the pulpit preaching. I mean, somehow they found out that this kid can preach. And that's where he began to really hone his homilies. He learned to preach to a text. Whatever the text was that Sunday, he learned to preach to it. And it's in that pulpit where he's discovered, about a year and a half later, by some Garrisonian abolitionists passing through New Bedford, and he saw this black kid preaching at the church, and this kid's good. Let's take him with us out to Nantucket to an anti-slavery convention and see what he can do. Um, he's 23 when he makes his first speech to white people. Now, writing with another man, that took time. He had help. He had mentors who was writing. I never did spell terribly well. Um, but he could hear the music of words in his head. He was quite young. And then reading, reading, reading. Um, it's phenomenal. I, I, I just can't, I, I kept wishing I could create a, a way of biography to show him Douglas at night, reading this, reading that, but I, I don't have that kind of evidence. I do know that at Cedar Hill, if any of you ever visit the house, you should. It's a great, they've restored the views of the house in Anacostia. Big house that he owned the last 16 years of his life. Out back, uh, he created a, a little stone cabin. He called it his growlery. It had one little window, a door, a desk, a chair, and a chaise lounge. It was his hideaway from all the grandchildren, had 21 grandchildren from all the chaos of his extended family, who were all dependent on him. And I'm totally convinced that's where he wrote Life and Times. Uh, he called it growlery because he took the term from uh, Charles Dickens' novel, Bleak House. There's a character in Bleak House who has a similar place to go and called it his growlery. 
He was a total Dickens fanatic, by the way, which a lot of Americans were. Dickens hated America, but Americans loved Dickens. Um, so there are many turning points in, in, the, in the writing, but you can already see the writing improving, especially when he becomes a newspaper editor. Because there he had to produce first um, weekly. His first newspaper in the North Star was a weekly. And he's writing two and three editorials a week, which is the short form, you know, the short form political declarative editorial. Um, the autobiographies, he's writing, you know, very floridly about himself in speeches, different kind of prose. But writing is something he really had to work hard at. And he had some mouths. So thanks for that question. I could go on and on. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Frank, why did they want Sure. Of wonderful black writers. Yeah. Okay. Who is? I know there's only one French Douglas, but who's today's Douglas? Yes. I don't know. Uh, that's not for me to say. There are about fifty. There are about fifty people who who could who could declare some place in that, I suppose. For some time, I think a lot of people have considered Cornell West and the Du Bois, although Cornell is very much from the Christian tradition, um, more than Du Bois ever was. Uh, there's a little bit of Douglas in Cornell, if you know Cornell West. I wouldn't say Ta-Nehisi Coates necessarily. Ta-Nehisi is a wonderful writer and a really serious thinker. Um, but he's a journalist first, and now he's a novelist. Um, and I don't know. That, see, this is this gets to be invidious distinctions. Um, there, there are. You know, we, we have a, an amazing array of African American writers, artists, thinkers in this country now, and have for a long time. Um, what I do find, as I've spoken here and spoken there. Um, and met many, many people. Douglas holds a place in this tradition, not because of this book I wrote, but Douglas holds a place for people. Tanahasi Coates, for example, I became good friends with Tanahasi. He grew up in Baltimore, as you may know, and uh, his, his book, uh, Between the World and Me, about his son and so on, was a huge bestseller. It's taught all over the place, and now he has this novel. Uh, about the Underground Railroad and Tanas and wrote so many great pieces for the Atlantic and so on and so forth. But over the years, I had some really good talks with Tanas and about Douglas, and he would say to me things like, David, you're writing about Douglas. You, you, you get that? This is Douglas. You get that? I said, come on, man, go. It's hard enough. Don't, don't do that to me. But he was so kind. And when the book came out, he came to Yale without being paid, and he could seriously pay. Uh, he could pay, he just did a talk with me about the book. And we couldn't find a hall big enough because of him. Because he just wanted to talk about Douglas. Uh, because growing up, he said, you know, we, we all knew about Douglas and Paul. We didn't know a lot about him, but somehow Douglas was the Baltimore story. He is. Douglas had to live nine years in Baltimore of his 20 years as a slave who wouldn't know about He doesn't escape if he's not in a city. So Douglas has, in fact, a good friend of mine just sent me a t-shirt. I collect lots of weird t-shirts, but this t-shirt, she bought it in Harlem, apparently on a table on the street, and it shows, I should have brought it to show it. It shows, uh, Six or eight of the most famous black men leaders in American history. But they've all been photoshopped and put in various positions. It shows Martin Luther King, and it's, and it's over a pool table. And they all got pool cues in their hands. So it's Martin Luther King doing a behind the back shot. <laughs> and it's got uh, Obama's in the back, kind of looking over the shoulder of Malcolm X, who's got a cell phone in his hand. I mean, it's weird. Thurgood Marshall's in the back with 
And he's leaning on this pool cue like this, you know. But in the middle of it, and then I'm forgetting, there are at least three other people in the, in the picture. But in the middle, larger than any of them, Thank you. 